Uh, welcome to Meet the Storytellers and uh, welcome Hugh Thomas, better known as Ugly Hugh. That's kind of what I always think of Hugh Thomas, Ugly Hugh. I always forgot your surname. How are you doing today, Hugh? I'm good, thanks, Ian. Yeah, I've uh, changed my name across all social media. So if, uh, if this all goes wrong, someone else has my actual name now. So I'm that for good, probably. <laughs> but uh, yeah, thanks for having me on today. Okay, cool. Well, look, um, we're talking about story. And I think, you know, maybe a good place to start is just hitting rewind, if you can, uh, if you can, if you can recall. And, and take you back, Hugh, to your, your childhood. And I mean, you know, you're an entrepreneur, a founder of, of Ugly Drinks. Obviously, you know, what... What did the eight-year-old Hugh want to be? Was there a sense at that age of wanting to be an entrepreneur? What, what's your backstory? I, um, so I'm from a town called Worcester in, uh, in the Midlands. And my mum and dad are, have pretty much had the same jobs all of my life. My mum is a nurse. Uh, she's been kind of right in amongst the COVID situation recently. So she's a real hero. But she's been a nurse all my life um, in Worcester. And my dad is a local uh, solicitor, a lawyer in the, in the town. He's had the worked at the same company for the same amount of time all my life as well. Um, so I was very privileged to grow up in a very safe, um, balanced, kind of uh, rational environment, which is probably why I'm the total opposite in many ways. Um, I had the, had the freedom to, I guess, express myself and uh, had a very, very strong safety net behind me, in that, if that makes sense. Like my mum and dad who are very stable. And I think... There was, I was pushed a lot to, not even pushed really, but like given the space and the opportunity to read a lot, to like listen to, you know, lots of audio books, read a lot, of, you know, and like just get, and, and also travel a lot, I guess, versus most people in my, in my youth and teens. And I think that just uh, gave me a, a curiosity, which has essentially um, metamorphosized itself into entrepreneurialism because I've just always been curious and always wanted to learn. And at school became, I guess, quite frustrated with the pace of things because mm. it wasn't necessarily what I wanted to learn or how I wanted to learn. And I think there was a, there was a couple of moments where you begin to realise what an entrepreneur is or what that even is. Um, I don't think when I was like eight years old, I think I probably still wanted to be a, a, a footballer or something like that. But <laughs> certainly I remember at like 11, 12, going to secondary school. I definitely re I read Richard Branson's book, uh, I think The Apprentice had just started on television, maybe. Um, the American Apprentice, certainly, which is weird in hindsight, looking back. But I remember watching an episode of that where they were selling lemonade in the street. Uh, and I just remember being like, I feel like I could do that better. Um, so yeah, then, and then it kind of just went from there. But I think what I realized from growing up a bit was like I actually needed to learn some stuff. Like, there's obviously a lot of stories about like teenage entrepreneurs and like bedroom entrepreneurs. And those people do exist. But I do think going through school, getting a few jobs and going through university and building my network has paid off quite a lot. So mm. um, just always tried to blend with different people from different backgrounds and always tried to learn from the people I'm around. So they say, what well, you're the average of the five people you spend your most time with. And I think I've always been quite conscious of that. Um, but yeah, I think from a very young age, it was always, I need to create my own destiny and always very uh, independently minded and, uh, probably quite hard to manage. I think I was described as unmanageable in my first job. So right. maybe that gives you an idea of how, uh, how I was in school, school projects and things like that. <laughs> unmanageable. That sounds a very good grounding to be an entrepreneur, run, start your own business uh, and, and be a founder. Um, <laughs> and and of, like that. of course, um, you know, here we are. Hey, look, I've got a, uh, which one, which one have I got this morning? Uh, I've got, uh, I've got this one. Um, um, here we are with our, uh, I've got Tropical this morning. Cheers. Uh, cheers. Here we are with this, uh, you know, amazing, amazing brand that you, you've created, Hugh. For those that don't know, you're a co-founder. There, there, there are two of you. Um, tell us that origin story. Go back to that, that rant mm -hmm. that two friends had in a pub and, and how, it, how it ended up with, uh, with, the, with these cans of uh, sparkling water. Yes. It's crazy. Um, so you say there's two of me. There's actually not two of me. There's uh, one of me and one of Joe. And Joe is my co-founder um, and he lives in London. Um, I live in New York now. Uh, Joe and I became best friends whilst working together at Vitacoco, which is a coconut water business. Um, we joined that business right when it first started in the UK. So it wasn't around. It didn't exist. Um, I'd previously been working at Heinz Ketchup, big brand. 
uh, joined there and you know that that company grew so fast and it was such an all hands on deck team environment with which became almost obsessive in the end we spent so much time working and hanging out within each other and, and socializing but also just you know up early stay out late celebrate the wins it kind of became addictive because it's just i mean when you don't consider work and then there's no balance between work and life which is kind of how i like it it was so all in that the idea of working somewhere else just became totally foreign and we never actually had a conversation saying let's start a company together it was never ever sit down meeting it really just started to happen because we were hanging out in whole foods at the weekend looking at different products on shelves so there was an event for Vitacoke or somebody was doing a demo and that's kind of just became the center of my orbit for my for my life really which is kind of sad thinking about it but mm. we also you know start going to the pub start debating what good ideas there were out there and I think there was a shared frustration at the you know and this is two guys in their early 20s right who that probably didn't have you know looking back now didn't have many worries about the world and um thought it was worth taking taking a chance and taking on the world's biggest companies that we're frustrated with you know the way the big soda companies push sugar and sweetener and the way they market refreshment and happiness and support the world's biggest sporting events just felt mm. like for for us at that age after a few pints <laughs> um a big enough uh, goliath to take on because we were realistic in knowing this is going to be a you know five five years which is almost what we're into this now in terms of like since that day in the pub um probably a 10-year journey you know if not longer and so it needed to be a big enough uh, challenge or thing for us to take on in a status quo that we weren't happy with mm. um so after a few beers i think you know you really begin to think about what what's it going to excite you and get you out of bed every morning for that next decade uh, and the idea of taking on the big soda companies and um trying to make also very very um very much wanted to create something that could be accessible for lots of people. There's a great Andy Warhol quote about Coca-Cola, which is the president of the United States and the bum on the street can't get a better can of Coke. And I've always loved that idea of like creating democratic products that everyone can afford. Mm. Um, and so what we wanted to do with Ugly was do the same, but for something healthy. And so that was kind of the, um, the beginning of that idea where it's like, how can we create a drink without any of the bad stuff in like soda? Um, but put it at a price point and wrap it in a brand and a world that felt like accessible, whatever your background was, wherever you come from, uh, and something you can afford as well for like less than a pound in the UK or less than a dollar over here. And that was kind of the beginnings of the business. And um, yeah, then you sit at your laptop and you Google, how do I start a company? Um, <laughs> and it kind of starts from there. That's a lovely mission, isn't it? That's a lovely mission that kind of puts fire in your fire in your tank as a as an entrepreneur. And uh, y y there's a nice story you can tell around that as well. I'm just curious to you that in your in your business journey and and getting funding and things like that, how much do you think a lot when you reflect back on how important story has been in terms of getting noticed? We'll talk about customers in a minute, but just talking about like getting getting funding, those relationships with investors, like mm -hmm. you know you standing up and telling that human story how, how important has that been i think it's probably the most important part of uh any business let alone our business and i and i personally speaking as myself believe too many of the brand stories of like new startups that launch haven't really been thought through and aren't authentic and they and they copy each other and they use similar brand cues and they don't speak from the soul about why they actually started this thing did you start it because you wanted to make lots of money or do you actually have a burning passion? Because there's no reason to start a drinks company if you want to make any money fast. It is brutal. Um, and and I, I would add to that, like obviously I just gave you like the very initial frustration that Joe and I had. It's like, if you, don't, if you don't want to drink sugar and you don't want to drink sweetener and one third of Brits and one third of Americans are pre-diabetic, sugar is the biggest kind of cause of that which was the initial frustration how do you solve that problem because there's families buying two liters of soda every day there's across america across the uk across you know mexico china i mean the list goes on where soda's a cause issue but also it felt like there was a a political change and a social political change as well um and around when we started we had um you know brexit beginning to start as the, the rumblings in terms of the uk market and you also have the total invention of the phrase fake news and alternative facts in America. Mm. Um, 
and it felt we we felt that there was a synergy between the idea of fake news and the de- way that consumers are frustrated as well with big food and drink companies with ingredients on the back of the pack that they can't read that they don't know the truth they don't know what's transparent and so for us the whole idea of truth and transparency and just telling people as it is is what informed the name of the company and informs the way we've also told the story tying it back um, certainly online and so if people follow me on linkedin they've probably seen everything that i can possibly share within reason from the beginning of the company now mm-hmm. and i think people who follow a story like what the, there's a great quote i think it's tony shea who's the founder of zappos he says a great brand is a story that never stops unfolding and so like for me that. i've always been very conscious of like what's the next chapter of the book that you're going to next and how do you tell that story because you get the most loyalty and the most engagement when people feel part of that story as well and we have a lot of fans and friends of the brand now and met a lot of people along the way who've who've got on to, bought into the story because it is genuinely authentic like mm. the the can the name on the can the word even the fact we chose that word was not the result of some corporate think tank it was two guys in a pub of frustration mm-hmm. um, and i think people can get behind that but then you have to keep telling it as it grows as well uh, and you also have to expose a bit of vulnerability too. So, you know, we're not afraid of telling the ugly truth, which is our tagline, but also, you know, we've made lots of mistakes on this journey. We make mistakes, you know, I make mistakes as a leader on a weekly basis, a daily basis. And I think if you try and hide that and protect it, you, know, you don't tell that story authentically, which is where the value is, I think. Mm. So, yeah, I was going to ask about that. It does seem that, I mean, you, you're a great brand on social media. You've got a lot of personality and it does feel that people that, uh, you know, they are fans. I was going to use that word, the word you just used. They're not just consumers, they're fans. And what difference has that made, especially, you know, in, in the US market, you know, you're in New York and that's why you went to New York to spearhead an expansion into the US. What difference has that made for a, for a kind of, you know, an underdog brand, if you like, coming along, because, you know, trying to, trying to make an impact and trying to make a noise in a market as big as the US, where you've kind of got those, those fans at a kind of grassroots level. Is that, does that, are they, have they become kind of evangelists, ambassadors for the brand, de facto? Yeah, so, so I guess one of the, the great things about Ugly is that we were very aware of the digital, I guess, revolution in terms of commerce from the beginning. So we've always had e-commerce and direct-to-consumer business set up. One of the reasons that's great is because when you move into the US and move into selling in this country, you can't physically be in every store, in every town, in every city overnight. Like, it's so big. It's so complex that you can't, but with e-commerce and people being able to buy us everywhere, we've been able to satisfy, you know, people in every state. So there are ugly fans dotted around the US, which, and dotted around the UK from John O'Groats to like Cornwall. There are people who bought ugly online and had deliveries and found out about us for different reasons, whether there's a story about the liquid and, and the health or a story about the brand or kind of what it means to them. And I think, that's been super exciting because we now have like a private Facebook members group. And I was looking the other day at where people are from. And I don't often take a time to take a step back, but you know, there's people from Maine, Tennessee, Kentucky, Ohio, California, Oregon, the list goes on. And it's like, we started this in my small apartment in central London with no money. And now there's somebody in Oregon who, who cares enough to join a private Facebook group about the brand that we've created. Um, and at the end of the day, like not to belittle it, but like, this is a very simple product. It's flavored water in a can. So it is wrapped in a story that gives it purpose and gives it a a reason to pick it up. And certainly a reason to pick it up versus the big companies. Um, and so if anything, you know, building community is, has been a focus for us. And if anything, I think the way the world is moving, it only becomes more important to focus on those people and to build a loyal group of, uh, you know, a community that you you almost get along with as a brand. And actually this morning, we're actually launching our first limited edition Ugly Flavor to our community only online in America. It's something we plan to take to the UK soon as well. But But we wanted to give back to them and the flavor is actually something they asked for. So there is a... We're trying, and it's, it's complicated because it takes quite a lot of work to get that loop going, but we're trying to get better at listening, um, learning about our 
the fans, as you say, and then giving back what they want. And um, so we're launching a cherry cola flavored sparkling water this morning. So no sugar, no sweetener, 100% natural. It tastes kind of like a cherry cola. Um, it's limited edition. When it's, sold, when it's gone, it's sold out. We've given early access to the people who followed us from the beginning. Um, so we'll see how it goes, but we're trying to think, I mean, going back to your question, trying to think around how we make the brand mean more to those people because that, that's what really matters to us. Mm. It's funny, you know, when I think about storytelling, I always think about an emotional engagement with an audience. And I don't know, I guess the emotional engagement that you've given those super fans and the launch of the new drink this morning is that there's kind of an intimacy there. You're not this big faceless organization, right? In, in how you tell your story and building those relationships. Am I right? I don't know, that's it just it. feels that there's an intimacy. Yeah, that's it. And you know, I, I am in the Facebook group as uh, Ugly Q. I comment and I reply to people as the founder of the business with my personal Facebook profile if people have issues. And mm. I am, you know, always in the social media, in the Instagram direct messages, even though we have, you know, most 50,000 Instagram followers now and hundreds of emails a day, you know, hundreds of direct messages a week. Like I'm keeping track of it because I think it's the best way to learn about your consumer is to really just get to know them. Mm. And I think now in a, in a post COVID world where we can't do as much of that in face to face, the digital elements only going to become more important. How do we, how do we get better at that? And so we spent a lot of time thinking about that over the last couple of months as well and how we can get better at serving the community and getting to know them. But the conversations are crazy. We had people last night guessing which flavor it's going to be next. And, the ideas from the community are so creative that <laughs> I'm there with a notepad writing them down saying, that's actually, that's actually a great idea, we should do that. Um, but it's win-win, right? If, if somebody in the community has a great idea and then the company does it and they love it, surely that is how things should go. I mean, mm -hmm. it's a much better way than a big corporate marketing team creating something nobody wants and shoving it down your throat. And so I think for us, it's been important to to cultivate that and um, one of the challenges for us has been doing it in, in two countries at once and so I think quite often the US can look like it has a lot of the focus but we're, we're very quickly getting to the place where we're going to be doing both things in both countries at the same time as well uh, given well for obviously from the UK that's mm. that's important so um, you know it's um, it, it's it's what I would recommend any uh, any new startup spend their time thinking about is how do you build that community and, and how are you going to tell the story to them and, and keep them engaged with it as it goes. Mm. Another way I see that Hugh as an outsider is following you on uh, Instagram, uh, not not just following the brand but following you. You know I don't know you well, but I get a sense by um, following you on Instagram. I've kind of got a sense of the real Hugh, and, and I and I and I guess that's a. I'm sure you're, well, tell me in a minute, you know, maybe your, your, your presence on Instagram is because you love, you love lifting the lid on you personally in your life. But I mean, I suppose the other thing is you're really building that strong relationship there, aren't you? Because people are getting a sense of who you really are, you know, in line with your whole ethos of the brand, being transparent, being open, being mm -hmm. honest. Yeah, I, I um, you know, if you look at my Instagram, what is it? I'll pull it up now. I mean, the number of times I posted photos is, almost embarrassing at this point but i'll explain why what have i done Seven thousand seven hundred forty-six posts wow. should be spending my time better probably <laughs> but for me i've never the reason i've posted so much is i've never i've never felt like i'm doing it for anyone else i've never felt like i'm trying to gain anything from it it's really for me a visual record of what i'm doing and the journey i'm going on and when I was, what, like 11, 12, I read Richard Branson's book, and I know he's not necessarily in the headlines for the right reasons right now, but <laughs> he, um, his story in his book, his autobiography inspired me. Um, and I always thought that the way that he took on British Airways and the way he tried to take on, you know, different challenges and, again, with his own cola as well, um, and taken a lot of failure, there's always a story like that inspired me. It's like, I've always felt that UK has so much to give the world and, and so, much, so many great things we've given the world and that spirit of adventure. But I wanted to almost show the ups and downs and my, just my life really on, in a visual format. And it's not really curated. I don't always put comment, copy up or captions. Mm. I just do it very quickly in the moment. Just because I think from 
you know, there's, it's real, right? And like, maybe I could put pic more pictures of the really bad stuff up, you know, because <laughs> there's lots of it. But I think yeah. it kind of gives people an idea of this, like the story. And you can go all the way back to the beginning of the company and almost track it. And sometimes I do that. And it's really just myself, to be honest. I just mm. have a visual record of everything that happened um, whilst I was doing it. But as you say, it is just authentic. And there is no, there's no editing process for me. It's just put it up, get on with it, what's next. Um, and I, you know, I kind of enjoyed doing it really. I love that. You know, that, that chimes with my own experience that, you know, Instagram is my favorite kind of platform. I love taking photographs and I like sharing my own story, you know, not in a, hopefully not in too much of a self-indulgent way, but I love kind of taking, taking meaning for my story too. So uh, yeah, I always, I always enjoy your posts, those nice Brooklyn restaurants and things to add to my list. Next time we can go out and have a meal. Ditto. <laughs> um, <laughs> so here we are in May yes, 20. I'll see you, see you, see you in six months or something. Yeah. So look, here we are in May 2020, um, you know, mid lockdown, here we are in, during the, these strange times, COVID-19. I'm just curious, Hugh, for you as an employer and a business leader, how much you're using stories kind of within the company to your team on both sides of the Atlantic? Are you, because I, I, I feel that business leaders and organisations right now have an opportunity to use storytelling to help kind of navigate through these times sharing stories about our experiences, kind of those tales from the trenches. You know, I don't want to romanticize it, but like, you know, I, I'm older than you and I grew up with um, my grandparents telling me war stories, you know, I'm just kind of, what are the stories we will tell of the, of the times we're living in? I'm just curious, you as an employer and, and, a, mm -hmm. and a business leader, as a boss, how you're using that, you know, behind the scenes. Yeah, I, I would say this is um, pr certainly the most challenging leadership experience I've had today. Um, leading a team into the unknown is, uh, you know, it's scary, right? I'm uh, away, from, away from home. Um, you know, there's no known, known end to this in sight. And it's certainly not the business plan we put together on January the 1st for 2020 <laughs> in either country. And it's certainly not the life plan any of my team had in place for 2020. And so um, I haven't necessarily... I would say I haven't necessarily got it right every day of the COVID experience so far, but I think what we've done a lot, we've done a lot of things well as well. Um, and I think being able to, you know, say like I have a coach myself who, you know, and I know, you know, Jerry Colonna and it's, uh, yeah. he's actually a linked coach with Jerry and um, he always uses the metaphor, which I've always loved. And we often talk about the metaphor, which is, being the captain on the ship going into a storm mm -hmm. um and a you know stormy sea never created us or stormy seas create skillful sailors and so i always try and head into team meetings and moments like that imagining myself as the captain with the wind and the rain in my face and the stormy seas ahead and i have to believe that there's calm seas beyond that um uh and so actually in this at the start of uh, start of the COVID experience, I actually got a, a really into. I watched, I rewatched Hornblower, which sounds crazy, which is like an old '90s British uh, naval <laughs> TV series, which sounds super nerdy. But I became really interested in the idea of captaining a ship through stormy seas, and I was thinking about all those people who went on those crazy ship journeys by sea. And there's obviously Shackleton who went to went to Antarctica the same way, and all these crazy journeys and long journeys people have been on where they've had to be very patient. Um, and you have to, you have to be able to paint a picture of the calm seas or paint a picture of the finish line. Um, and honestly, as a leader, it can be daunting and exhausting, certainly when things are as unknown as they are. Mm. But I think being able to continue to stick to the mission and bring things back has been helpful. And then the other thing is, I have personally been more vulnerable with the team than I've always been quite vulnerable, but trying to be vulnerable and create an environment where people can be vulnerable um, and tell their own stories, as you say, um, makes this better. And I think we still have work to do. I'm still trying to work out how you have, how you create a culture and manage a culture for, I mean, what feels like we're going to be in this for the long run now. This isn't a, you know, four weeks in, you're like, great, we can handle this for four weeks. Now I'm into week 10, 11 of doing this. You know, maybe we've got another six months of this ahead before 
you know, who knows what the world looks like at that point. And so now I'm going, okay, well, if this is the new normal, what does leadership in that environment look like? You can navigate the initial choppy seas, but what, how do you navigate the new normal? And I think that is, that takes a much more long-term uh, thinking approach to how you get people to, you know, think in the long run. And I know in UK politics, we were talking before we joined on the call, I mean, they have the short and long-term uh, process to navigate. Um, and that's a delicate balance that they're playing, maybe not necessarily getting it right, but I think I have to not stray the line in terms of over-promising things are gonna get better quickly mm. whilst keeping people focused on the long run. And I think that is, as a leader, the biggest challenge I have right now in terms of keeping the team motivated because you know, life is tough for everybody right now. As you said, everyone's in the same boat. Mm. Um, so how do you keep people motivated when, you know, at the end of the day, selling drinks right now is kind of pointless, but you know, we have a massive purpose and things will come out the other side and there is a big, big purpose behind what we're doing. Mm. Um, and so keeping the team focused and, you know, short-term and long-term wins is, uh, is vital, but I'm still working it out. And so I'm always keen to learn how other people are approaching it as well. Well, look, I mean, I admire your honesty. And I think, uh, you know, when leaders lead and start being vulnerable, then people can follow, you know, you kind of uh, s signal, signal the way. So um, that's good to hear. Um, look, we're nearly out of time. But before we wrap up, Hugh, I'd love to know, like, you know, when you're, when you're not in, with, with your sleeves rolled up on ugly, uh, what kind of stories you're drawn to, you know, just, uh, just when Hugh's hanging out, you know, you have some time on your hands in the evenings right now, you know, what kind of things are you drawn to apart from a uh, series about the Royal Navy? You know, what, what kind of are you watching on Netflix or podcasts you're listening to? What stories <laughs> do you love to soak up? No, I've, I've always been um, a mo moving on that front. And I think maybe in my, in my 20s, I was obsessed with the kind of how I made it type stories and I think uh, as I've got older and realized what really matters in life I think that's become less and you know less important to me um, and I think what really interests me now is is people who've been able to find balance and people who've been able to create a life that works for themselves so that's very much what I've been interested in I've been reading a lot more uh, spiritual stuff recently um, uh, a lot more authentic storytelling because certainly in America, I found that the startup conversations are very, you know, it can make you feel unsuccessful if you listen to how I made it every day and you listen to all these success stories. And the more you get behind the curtains, you realize none of it's true anyway. And so how do you measure success and what those things are? And I think I'm trying to get better. I think certainly in my twenties, I was so focused on building a company that maybe now looking for more balance is the key. So the last 12 months, I've been trying to watch the movies I've got on that list that I've never watched, listen to the music, listen to the podcasts about stuff that's totally different to what I'm typically interested in, you know, learning about different parts of the world and how it works. I gave up, um, gave up alcohol for the first four months of the year um, this year, um, which gave me so much more clarity than before. And, you know, as a, as a Brit who grew up, you know, you know, drinking from a pretty young age, realistically. It's given me a lot of clarity to, to explore different things. And so that's really kind of what I've, where I've moved to. And I know you're a Jerry Colonna fan as well, Ian, and his book Reboot was a big trigger in me kind of re-examining my personal behaviors and beliefs. Um, it doesn't happen overnight necessarily. The book isn't the fix, but the book is the thought process creator. So, you know, my, my stack of reading, which I'm looking at right now, which is why I'm looking into the distance, this is way more varied than uh, previous years. So um, I think um, that's, that's been uh, interesting for me. And um, yeah, that's kind of where I'm spending my time is thinking about different stuff right now to try and take my mind off the world's impending doom. <laughs> Well, look, good luck with uh, working your way through that pile. And here we are, you know, we all don't know what the next chapter in our story uh, is going to bring, but I look forward to following you uh, uh, on social and uh, enjoying that uh, non-alcoholic drink with you in some Brooklyn uh, <laughs> bar in the next uh, early 2021, maybe. But um, thank you very much for joining me and uh, really enjoyed it. Of course, Ian, the next, next chapter is going to be interesting for us all. So, like, I wish you the best and stay safe, etc. Thank you very much, Hugh.